how have you seen or how do you see the theme for this year's African Union Day? And what is your own thoughts towards this theme? Let's start with uh, Dr. Fedewa. Whilst we were younger and joined the debating clubs, we talked about this. We are old. We are handing over the baton to other generations of uh, academics. We're still talking about it. For me, what it tells me is that Africa, over time, have been good at uh, documenting our challenges, but not finding sustainable solutions to them. If we were, today we should have been speaking of something else. Uh, things comparative to what our colleagues in the West are talking about. Uh, a colleague earlier talked about uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, other things that uh, the West may be talking about now should have been what we should be talking about. But it does appear to me that time in and time out, we keep discussing issues of famine, food insecurity, issues of health, and we attribute these to factors that are outside of the domain of Africa. We say it's COVID, we say it's Ukraine. Reality is that before Ukraine and COVID, hunger was a thing in Africa. Why are we still talking about it today? It tells us about the failures of uh, our continent, Africa, and we cannot put the blames at the doorsteps of others. When we say Africa, you are Africa, I am Africa. I grew up being African, I am African now, and I'll die African. So it is a collective challenge, and as we speak, I would urge that we should be proffering solutions rather than digging on the issues of the problems, because we have overheard the problems over time. Thank you. Ghana is not just at the level of malnutrition, because malnutrition covers undernutrition and overnutrition. That is what we call the double burden. And currently, even in the villages, where we had stunted and emaciated children, you still have cases of obesity in there. So food security and all these things are things we need to really talk about. Because it has been proven that even the performance of these kids in school has to do with certain nutrients that they need to have. Without that, your cognitive abilities are not able to be at its zenith. So before we can think about what the other Western countries are doing, let's get it right. Let's prepare solutions. Let's take actions. And then we will be able to, I mean, look back 10 years, five years from now, and tell the story. We had the fundamentals wrong. Growing up, who was asked to farm? When you are in class, and you are going to be punished. What was the first punishment? Go to the farm and weed. So from inception, the whole idea of getting to farming was, was a punishment, whether we like it or not. That was the kind of uh, introduction we had to farming. At home, let's go to the farm. And the kids that were so bright were left to go for vacation classes. And the ones that were deemed not so bright will follow the father to the farm. Yeah. There again, there was a challenge. Mm -hmm. So before we can, I, I always, when I sit on panel discussion, I want to break it down. Yeah. I want to break it down. I don't want us to use the jargons and the terms. Let's, as people of, in higher level of education, we have an understanding of the concepts. Let's break down the concepts. Let's break down, let them understand when you're talking about fertilizer, the droppings from the kitchen is a fertilizer. Bring it to their level. Mm. Then we are able to find solutions. Those would be my opening words. Thank you. Great. Let's hear from Irene as well. Dr. Irene. Thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to be a part of a discussion like this. For me, the theme fills me with hope. Mm -hmm. Because I think that although we have been talking about these things for decades, yeah. if we dare to do something, we can change our world. Mm. We have the resources, we have the manpower. The adjustments we need, I think, are possible with those of us in higher education. Mm. And someone might say, oh, we've been talking about this forever. But what if some of us went out and did something? Mm. And little by little, we can make a real difference. So I'm still filled with hope that we can make a difference. Great, great, fantastic. Let's hear from you. OK, thank you very much. Um, Good afternoon to the panel, and good afternoon to the audience. 
Um, today's theme is well positioned and well crafted for today's discussion and for the celebration of the African Union Day. Yeah. What I want to say is that, yes, Africa has been left behind in terms of the Green Revolution, in terms of the digital revolution, mm -hmm. and the next AI revolution, I'm sure we are going to be left behind if we do not take action immediately. And so this panel discussion, high level panel discussion is very important. And the theme for the discussion, which is on nutrition, yeah and fighting hunger and poverty is, is very, 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 very important. I would like to state that, yes, hunger and poverty has been with us for ages. Um, Kwame Nkrumah, in his opening remarks, mm -hmm. our very own Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, stated, and I quote, we shall accumulate machinery, establish steel works, iron foundries, and factories, we shall link the various states of our continent with communication. We shall astound the world with our hydroelectric power. We shall drain the marshes and swamps, clear infested areas, feed the undernourished, and rid our people of parasites and diseases. Mm. It is within the possibility of science and technology to make even the Sahara Desert bloom with vast field of verdant vegetation mm -hmm. for agricultural and industrial development. Great. This was in 1963 mm -hmm. at the uh, African Union, the OAU. OAU. Uh, meeting. Now, this tells us that we, we know the direction to head, which is science and technology. Mm -hmm. Science and technology is best positioned at the higher education level. That is where we teach people to develop, uh, we teach the youth to develop their minds to think critically, solve problems, re-engineer systems. And so the systemic problem of hunger and malnutrition must be addressed through what? Higher education, yeah. science, innovation, and technology, which is the pillars on which we can have the Africa we want, Absolutely. which is the agenda. 2063. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. So on this premise, we kickstart our discussion. And I want to ask, you know, the King of Lesotho, who is now serving as the African Union Nutrition Champion, in the reports, that's the African Union Nutrition Strategy Report, he expresses his pleasure uh, sincerely that he doesn't understand why a, a continent blessed with so much vegetation and so much resources is still uh, wallowing in the challenge of malnutrition and nutrition and hunger. It's bit of imagination. And I want to throw it to you, Dr. Fedawa, from your point of view. Do you think that it is about, like, we have the, we are in the right time to wallow about malnutrition with all that we are endowed with? Well, thank you very much. I think I'll tell a story. A lot of my narrations will be story-based. Thank you. I do think that... Uh, Whilst we sat here for the first session, a colleague made a bold statement regarding corruption and mismanagement. Mm -hmm. And I think what, that's one of the key challenges relative to Africa and its issues of malnutrition and related issues. Mm. The kids' frusta frustration is not out of place. But of course, like I stated earlier, we would be here to proffer solutions and not bemoan the problems. Mm. I was privileged to be sent to teach in Nigeria by ECOWAS as a... a an ECOWAS scholar. Mm -hmm. Specifically, I went to Crawford University in Igbessa. Now, I'm using that to establish the issues of uh, higher education and how we can help solve this problem. Okay. Now, entrepreneurial skills or entrepreneurship was taught in that university. And what they do is that, whilst you are in the entrepreneurship class, you have to choose a field. Mm -hmm. 
So for instance, if it's agriculture you want to do, there is a farm for you. Okay. So practically, you're doing agriculture whilst you're also practicing the theoretical bits of entrepreneurship. Mm. When you harvest your proceeds, it is in the shops of Crawford University. So somebody comes to buy, you make income, university makes part of the income. If you are not into agriculture and you are doing some other thing like soap making or batik tie and dye or clothing, you're still generating income. And remember, malnutrition doesn't come out of agriculture alone. If you are into soap making and you are not into agriculture and you have money, you can buy agricultural products. So it boils down to the way we teach in our universities. That is one of the key areas that we'll have to address in order to what? Allay the fears of that young ambassador who thinks that Africa is so much blessed, yet it appears we are cursed when it comes to what? Food. That is just one part of it. Mm -hmm. If you permit me, I'll also draw from our own country, Ghana. Yes. When we were young, we knew of Operation Feed Yourself. And the Kufu, uh, uh, Kutua Champong. All of us, if you are in your home, create a garden. You can get your basic vegetables from your own what? Gardens. Are we together? Yes, and we had state farms. So when you produce, there was ready market by what? The state. Does it make sense to you? Yeah. Then the state exports, we get foreign exchange to buy things that we do not what? Have. Mm -hmm. So we think the reigns of Kutua Champong, Ghana was self-sufficient when it comes to what? Food. So there are benchmarks that we can what? Borrow from. Now we go to Botswana. I was privileged again to be taken to Botswana as a, uh, a CEDA uh, exchange fellow, academic to teach at Boto University. Now when I went to Botswana, the first meal I had, when you know when you have uh, very special visitors in our camp culture, they bring you for a lot of meat. And yes. Now, when I got there, because I was a visitor coming, this, mm -hmm. the university organized a dinner, and it was guinea corn, guinea corn, mm -hmm. pulp made out of guinea corn. Mm -hmm. I come from, the, from Northern Ghana. Yeah. In Northern Ghana, where I come from, that is to, thought to be food for the poor. Okay. All right? That red guinea corn, people are not too proud of it. But this is symbolic of a, a national what? Meal in another what? country. It just tells us that sometimes you have to patronize your what? Your own. Mm -hmm. Because that is very nutritious. And of course, even without uh, all of uh, the compliments of so much meat, it is better than eating TZ made out of what? Corn. Guinea corn is better than corn nutritiously. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm just drawing from these benchmarks to tell us that there are feasible ways of getting food so becoming food sufficient living healthy, and also becoming what? Economically beneficial to our economies. Mm. So these are just my opening remarks. And as time goes on, when it comes to me again, I, I may prefer some other opinions that may be of interest to the discourse. Great. So we're actually moving to the next item. You know, it's strengthening agro food systems, uh, the health aspect as well. Just look at the health aspect. In Africa, Africa and our health systems in playing a role to accelerate human social and economic development. Let's hear from you, Michael, with the outlook of the African health system. How well is, how well robust or how organized our health system will and ready to solve situations of uh, turbidity and mobility, uh, people in, uh, in Africa with regards to mobility, as our health system in the right position to ensure human social economic development. All right, Mr. Jivan, I'm sure when you ask about health system in Ghana, all of us in this room know the realities on the ground. And on the onset of COVID somewhere 2019, 2020, there were reports that the streets of Africa would be littered with dead bodies because we didn't have the health systems to cater for what was going to happen. Yeah. So definitely we don't have the very best. But I like the orientation of the panel members and even the energy in this room that we are not looking at the challenges. We are looking at the solutions. So I would take it from this angle. What do we do with what we have? Yeah, you're from Margaret House. Exactly. So 
like I said, for AgriHouse, we look at gaps. What are the gaps? Mm -hmm. And how do we resolve these gaps? So let me tell you about what we did during the COVID. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was one of the sessions the president addressed, and he talked about us eating a lot of fruits and vegetables. Yes. So I put, we put together a proposal. Mm -hmm. And I think that time in Accra, there was this lockdown, Accra and Greater Kumasi. The whole place was shut down. <laughs> that time, I knew they mostly found my way to Tamale. So we didn't have it there. Quick, we put together um, a proposal that whoever wanted to do a garden in, in their homes. Mm -hmm. And in one week, we had over 800 subscriptions. Mm -hmm. We brought together what we call the one each, one household, one garden initiative. Mm. And we had about 800 subscriptions within a week. And what we were saying was, we are not looking at any big um, acreages. And we developed just one meter square for fruit and for vegetables. And if you don't even have arable land, we came out with boxes, old tins, and people who even had cemented floors were able to do that. I must say, we didn't do any baseline study before that project, but the impact that we had, people growing their own um, tomatoes, onions, carrots, broccoli, and also we gave out free seeds. Marketers don't want to hear this term, superfoods. Mm -hmm. But in Ghana, we know of our dawa dawa, we know of our leifu, dog who know of bra, and these are very nutritious leaves. So because we can't be so much dependent on a non-existent health system, to me, prevention is better and cheaper than cure. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? We identify the gaps. Let's make use of what we have. And by using nutrition, getting the right, getting the weird also involved. I, for my first degree, I was, I always say this, I was a home science student at the University of Ghana. And I was in the same department, the doc, I mean, it was a Greek and home science. And I wasn't shy, I was, we were just about three or four guys. So we realized that at that time, Riyadh and Ministry of Agri were working together while the extension agents were teaching them how to farm, mm -hmm. women in agri development were teaching them how to cook properly, mm. not overcooking vegetables, making use of foods around us. Now people are spending so much in buying cauliflower and, and buying broccoli and everything. Whilst we have equally locally found um, leafy vegetables that can do even more, mm -hmm. I was telling somebody, do you know there's, much too, uh, there's um, more vitamin C in Gava than in the vitamin C you bought? <laughs> he was astonished. Like, yes, that's for my training. I'm a home scientist. Mm. Then I went back for my MPhil. I read Food Nutrition and Community Utilization. So we have a lot around us. So mm. I will pick it up. Because we don't have such a robust system, let's look at the pre preventive medicine. Mm. Let's use what we have to build on what, what we can get. And lastly, we also had, um, just last year, we also embarked on, on a project with one of the, the member of parliament, I don't know whether he's allowed to mention the name, we called it Is Possible, where we gave training to people in mushroom production, in snail rearing, and in rabbit keeping. Mm. These are meeting then. And when you look at the nutrition profile and what the uh, mushroom would give you, for those who want to go, who don't want to do so much of the meat and all that, that is a healthy replacement. So let's look at the gaps. What can we do to fill in the gaps? And to me, that would get Africa prepared. Trust you me, if importations to Ghana should be cut for a month, we will be found wanting. Even with our local poultry sector, are we able to fend for ourselves? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because the cost of production is so high, we end up buying from what is important. And you know how long they've been kept on the high seas? You are virtually eating to please your taste buds. There's nothing nutritionally beneficial in there. So to me, we, don't, we, we, can't, we can't be so confident on our health system. 
Let's look at what we have and build on that. Thank you. Splendid. So let me just go to you, um, Dr. Irene. Um, you know, from the perspective of good nutrition and how what it entails and its benefits in trying to accelerate human capital development. Uh, people don't really understand why, you know, we just can't eat anything. I mean, what I have is what I have, so I get what I want. Must people be particular about what they consume and how does it play a role in preparing them or building them to contribute effectively to their country or their continent? Okay, so there's a saying that you are what you eat. And I think when we were growing up, it was easy to go for the highly processed foods because at that time, it seemed like the hip thing to do. But as we've become more educated, we've realized that if we want to live long, mm -hmm. if we want to be healthy, mm -hmm. we're going to have to watch what we eat. Mm. And so I think even the young people, my children who are 30, 24, and 21, are very aware of what they eat because they've been educated right from primary school about what impacts foods will have on you. Great. And as we see what's happening, so in the UK, for example, we're told one in uh, two people will have cancer. Hmm. Now that is a terrible statistic. Yeah. And that is the sort of thing that tells us that we now need to watch and prevent these things from happening. So unless we are healthy, we're not able to contribute in our jobs, we're not able to contribute in our homes, we're not able to contribute in education, and all those gifts that are within us go to pot or mm. go to waste. And so I think nutrition is really important, not just for how we look, but really for what it is that we have as our purposes in life. Mm. Um, in what uh, Dr. Awa was saying, I just wanted to touch on that briefly. Yes. Um, so the gentleman, and I think the gentleman might have left the room, the one who said, Look, the leaders, the next, the upper generation, those of us older people have failed the youth. I think that in higher education, we have a responsibility in terms of what we tell our students. Because we can give our students hope yeah. and we can teach them about ethics. Yeah. I watched an ethics class remotely. I won't mention the university. But at the end of the ethics class, I said to my colleague, we were doing an exchange, so he watched my class and I watched his. And I said to him, sir, all the models that you shared were models from the West. Mm -hmm. How about our African situation where we're facing serious corruption issues? Yeah. And he said to me that the students have said to him, well, if you can't beat them, join them. Mm. And I think that's where we're failing in higher education. Yeah. If we don't give our students hope, if we don't tell them there are alternatives, if we don't show them the alternatives, then I think we'll continue to be the way we are in many ways, rather than breaking new ground and doing new things. Yeah. I think we need entrepreneurial leadership. So Dr. Awa talked about entrepreneurship. That's where I work. Sure. And in terms of entrepreneurial leadership, we talk about, so my colleague was talking about the whole idea of science and technology. Mm -hmm. We talk about entrepreneurial leadership and say entrepreneurial leaders need to be cognitively ambidextrous. Mm -hmm. So not only do we need science and technology, we need creativity, we need the arts. Yes. We need everybody working together. And when we've had projects, for example, working with Rwanda, we've had students from biotech, but we've had students from business and marketing working together to come up with solutions. Mm -hmm. So we need to acknowledge that actually home science is really important. Mm -hmm. So although I studied my doctorate and everything, I run a cake decorating business on the side, and I'm into real estate, there is no reason why we can't be involved like that. So a couple of weeks ago, I was up till 4 a.m. baking pies and making rock buns. Why not? You know, sometimes we cheat ourselves by thinking that, okay, let's go in the science path. If you're bright, you just do science. There might be other things that people can do, and mm -hmm. why are we not exploring that? Mm -hmm. I think we also need to think about the design of our curriculum. So we talked about how we teach. But you know, why don't we give our students the opportunity to select other subjects apart from their main subject? So one of my children did fr uh, French yeah. alongside chemical engineering. Mm -hmm. She actually got the French prize. I've never heard her speak French in the house, but you know, <laughs> this is the idea that you know, give students more of a breath and you will discover so much talent and so much skill. The other part of um, uh, entrepreneurial leadership is the fact that we will have social and corporate responsibility. Mm. 
so we will be ethical in our approach. Yeah. And some people say we're dreamers, but if at least we tell our children, this is the right way. Yeah. Should they choose not to go that way, at least they have that option. Mm. And then there's social and self-awareness, how we relate to each other, how we work together. And if I had my way, we wouldn't have the departments we have in our universities. We would be much more merged, working together collaboratively and creating things. Mm. And my last point is about a module we put together. Yeah. It's called Innovative Consultancy Solutions. We realize that actually we need to work more with industry and with our local community. So the whole of the 12 weeks, students solve problems for real businesses. Mm -hmm. So they spend time with CEOs talking about their problems. They go away, do the research, come up with solutions, and that becomes their mindset. That learning is not just about the theory. It's not just about writing exams. It's about solving problems in our society and changing the world. Great. You can put your hands together for my panelists, you know, as they are making the points available. You know, Dr. Johnny Blebu uh, from Waki, you know, there's this issue with um, food insecurity. Uh, with all the arable lands that we have, and then we still can't produce, uh, it's, it's a problem. And I want to ask you, what is wrong with our lands? Is it our lands, or we haven't got enough ideas to create more crops? From your point of view, what is the deficiency? Uh, thank you for the question once again. And um, just to state that I'm representing the West Africa Center for Crop Improvement. Sure. And I teach also at the Biotechnology Center, University of Ghana. Now, at the West Africa Center for Crop Improvement, which is a glowing center, mm -hmm. a center of excellence sure. in Africa, is for the whole West African sub-region. Mm -hmm. And so we have gone through all the theories and the practicals and teach our students, one, how to develop improved varieties of crops. Okay. I'm trying not to be too technical. Okay. So we teach them how to develop varieties that should be adaptable to the land, okay. to the environment. Okay. And so at Waki, we have enrolled since 2007, mm -hmm. since inception, mm -hmm. we've enrolled 160 PhDs in plant breeding. So this 160 PhDs, mm -hmm. out of that, we have 105 PhDs that have graduated. And these graduates are working in their home institutions from 19 different countries in Africa and they are developing varieties. And it is amazing to say that mm -hmm. they've developed 187 improved varieties of crops, including rice, maize, taro, sweet potato, cassava, granite, cowpea, soybean. Nice people, put your hands together. Put your hands together. Aren't you hearing what's happening here? So many varieties. Mm -hmm. And these varieties are not just uh, low yielding. They are high yielding, highly nutritious, well adapted to the environment mm -hmm. because we teach them that you have to do what we call G by E, mm -hmm. looking at the genotypes and the environment okay. and checking to make sure that the varieties that you are growing in the communities are adapted to those conditions. Okay. You know, Ghana imports a lot of seed yes. to plant. We import seed. Mm -hmm. And Africa, as a matter of fact, most African countries are importing seeds. Whilst you are there. Whilst we can develop varieties that are adaptable to the environment, that are high yielding, and that have high germination, and therefore you have higher productivity. We then launched a project that is the African Union project, and we are very grateful to, to the African Union, uh, supported by the European Union, that project was ranked number two globally mm -hmm. out of 350 European Union supported projects. Great. It ranked number two. Great. That project, out of that project, we trained about 4,000 farmers across Ghana, Burkina Faso, and Nigeria mm -hmm. on how best to 
do good agronomic practices, manage the soil challenges, manage pest diseases, and use innovations that we have developed, that is high yielding maize, uh, rice, tomato, and cowpea varieties. And so these are showing us that in Africa, we can do the training of Africans on African problems to solve those problems here in Africa using centers of excellence, which is a model that we need to really adopt and scale out and roll out across the continent to solve the key challenges that we have. So the solutions are there. We are working on them. We are also working with industry. Now we, at WACI, we have launched in 2019 Kofi Annan Enterprise Hub for Agricultural uh, Ag Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Okay. And at that hub, we work with MIT, we work with uh, the European Union and other European uh, universities mm -hmm. to train our faculty first on entrepreneurship and we have developed curriculum yes. that is innovative and integrates ent entrepreneurship into our training program so that we are churning out graduates from the College of Agriculture, uh, College of Basic and Applied Sciences and the School of Agriculture, working with WACI, will be churning out graduates with what? Entrepreneurial skills. Okay. And so we are laying the foundations to be able to move entrepreneurship so that the youth are able to get that uh, knowledge and they are able to pick innovations that we develop and get it to farmers and get it to the, the stakeholders that need it. All of this is going to increase incomes and income is the number one lever when you want to, or driver, when you want to change and have impact on nutrition and on well-being well and healthcare. Because with increased incomes, farmers or smallholder farmers and people living in rural communities will be able to afford we talk about affordability when we speak about food insecurity, affordability, accessibility, and all of that. So the model is to be able to get the youth, get investments from government, mm -hmm. so that the impact that we have shown over the decade can be scaled out and rolled out across the continent. Thank okay. You. you know, I would want to just mention a couple of things for you to uh, appreciate and then we go to the way forward. I know that we all are aware of the SDG goal number two, uh, SDG two, that says zero hunger, and also number three says good health and well-being. We have the African Agenda 2063 also talking about a prosperous Africa. We'll have the Comprehensive Af Africa Agreed Development Program, CAADP. We have the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, which focuses on improving food security for smallholder farmers in Africa. We have the Regional Agri Policy for West Africa, ECOWAS, uh, which targets ending hunger and halving poverty by 2025. So, as you all will appreciate, we've got the treaties, we've got the policies, all nice gazetted. The question is, where the lever? Who is not pushing what? What are we missing? Who is not acting? Waki has just said something amazing. Uh, they are training people on how they can develop Variable, variables, right? All these Variety. varieties. So I think that we have all the right mechanisms in place. So, Dr. Fred, from you, what are we missing now? Well, I think that we are missing ourselves. Missing ourselves here means that it's a collective responsibility. The day of putting blames at the doorstep of government is gone. Mm. I do believe that Africa doesn't have bad leaders, but uh, bad leaders, but we also have bad followers. Oh. Right. So it's a collective responsibility. Before you choose a leader, you take kerosene or petrol or matches. So it means the leader has already bought your conscience. You, the follower. Mm -hmm. So when he gets in there, the matches and the kerosene he gave you, he will try to get it back. That is where you now tend to say he is a bad leader. So I think it's collective responsibility. Mm -hmm. Collective responsibility in the sense that we all have to play the roles that we have to play towards ensuring that we solve the problems 
of the continent. So if I am an agri officer in the village and the Ministry of Agriculture brings fertilizer for the distribution of other rural folks, I shouldn't store it and then sell it. I am part of the problem, but I don't see it as such. I see government. <laughs> do you understand? And the other rural folks in there do not see me as the challenge. They see government as the challenge. Yes. So I think that it's, a, it's, it's an orientation. It's a turn of a mindset. Collectively, we have a responsibility to change it. And then it begins from you and I speaking here and acting it. So a lot of people sit on panel discussions like this. Mm -hmm. And what they speak doesn't reflect what they do. So I think that we must mean whatever we say here. And if those, these younger people see us acting our talk, tendencies are that they will follow suit. In line with that, I think I want to prove us some bit of solutions. Absolutely. And here a story will suffice. Mm -hmm. I was born to a nurse mm -hmm. in Bogatanga when I was young. Yes. And even though she was a nurse, if I was sick, she would treat me with neem, like especially malaria. It was the most prevalent Ill, ailment by then. So neem tree, boil it, give you the water, you drink, and then you are okay. And the question now arises, I am getting to my 50s. So all of this period, why hasn't the government of Ghana taken clue from using the neem tree to create some malaria medicine? Locally made, mm -hmm. because there is evidence that the neem tree solves issues of what? Malaria. Basically what I'm saying here is indigenization. We have a lot of local medicines that take care of all of the ailments that are related to us as Ghanaians and Africans. So we invest a lot of money into such or we support organizations that are already into such so that we can have local solutions to what? Our problems. And I'll go back to higher education where all of us are. Now, the nature of our courses also sometimes are problematic. So we have to start rethinking our courses to reflect our local conditions in order to be able to solve them. Mm. So I pull, you are in an African center of excellence. I'm a student. I'm, I'm on a second doctoral at a, an African center of excellence, Lagos State University, the African center of excellence into transformative STEM education. And they have introduced courses such as STEM and entrepreneurship. So STEM is on one side, entrepreneurship the other side. But of course, if you are an agriculturalist, you should be able to know how to, to create money out yes. of agriculture. That's where the entrepreneurship comes in. So I think that we have to rethink the courses that we, 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 we offer in our universities, and that would be another pragmatic way forward towards taking us out of hunger, making us food sustainable, and then ensuring that we are healthy by using indigenous medicines absolutely refined because in times past we didn't know dosages you just take any quantity that came your way but now we should be able to do that with technology and innovation and I just want to add a bit to the teaching methods that uh, my sister proffered. you know we have been taught to with the lecture method and we are teaching with the lecture method today but of course <laughs> it is problematic I've done this a myriad of studies uh, on challenges relative to the teaching method and public administration where I, I, where I teach. And I realized that it's not effective. So I, I borrowed a local context from Africa, cultural techno-contextual approach by Professor Kebukola of Lagos State University. <laughs> so I did a study between CTC and lecture method. Teaching this class with lecture method, teaching the other with CTC in the same semester, at the end of the period, I set examinations for both of them, strike the averages, and consistently, the CTC has proven to be a better teaching method than the lecture method. This is of African origin. Not East, not North, just West Africa right here. So teaching methods must also be looked at if we want to make ourselves food sustainable and if we want to live healthy because what you teach the children or the students, sorry, not children, what you teach the students and how you teach it would reflect in the productivity that comes thereafter. So I think that uh, we should uh, collectively look at these issues and Africa will become better. Thank you very much, Dr. Fred, uh, for your submission. Let's now go to Michael for yours as well. You were at AgriHouse and you went to the Agricultural Value Chain Advocacy and all that. Where do you think that we can uh, accelerate in terms of the value chain? Where do you find us quite uh, sluggish? And where can we actually put in more efforts 
so that the issue of malnutrition and food security will be sealed because we're, we're better off in this continent. We're better off. All right. So at Agri House, we believe in the whole value chain approach, end to end, right from land preparation to production to even transportation okay. to marketing to ICT, even to project management. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why. So by virtue of the works we do, we, we sometimes recruit for agri companies. And consistently, the feedback we were having is, anytime you give us these people at the interview, they are very good. They speak the right English. They are able to define and rattle. But when they come on the job, mm -hmm. we find them lacking. So, we, so that's one gap over there. And we introduce the agricultural student um, career boot camp where we come students from over 19 institutions, universities, um, farm institutes. And it would, uh, it's interesting to know that most of the farm institutes in Ghana are closing down. I went to a, one of the, as a fair river institute, they had just one student mm. in Ghana. And this is a country who pride himself with being serious of agriculture. So when we bring them together, we mentor them, we pair them with the national best farmers, we pair them with student farmers, and after the three years, we took some of these same students, and the CEOs were asking us, where were they? We turned back into these were the same people we brought. It means that something basic was happening. I don't know if it has changed, but those times at the University of Ghana, a great student had the most credit hours, they were so busy. Nobody has time to teach you communication skill, negotiation skills, how to even present yourself. Because we need to move from that picture of that old, stricken, poverty-laden farmer. And now, we were saying most of our youth are into ICT. I have one of the cohorts from this year who has created an online platform for a seed company in Ghana, and they have paid them big money. Right there, we are solving, we are solving issues. So I think, basically, we need to look at the entire value chain, not segregating production from marketing. And that has been our bane. We think it's only about production, production, production. There's, there's a place for everywhere. I went somewhere in Bulga, in one of the villages, mm -hmm. And Wellington Boots were being hired. But that was somebody's job. He has about 100 Wellington Boots, and he was hiring them out for farmers. And this was a person who was doing NAPCO, and his, his salary hadn't come. And that was what he was making out of it. That is not a very good example, but that tells you the ingenuity, that there are opportunities along the value chain. Mm. And one important thing I also want to talk about, especially in this environment of higher learning, is data. Every time before students graduate, they carry out theses and all that. What yes. do we do with that data? They say they are, they are, they are shelved. What do we do with them? And sometimes students will even pay other colleagues or those during the M fields to do it for them just because they want to graduate. What are, do, are we doing with those data? Some come up with very innovative ways. This same Axstad Mentorship Bootcamp I'm talking about, just to tie in with what Doctor said, this same neem works perfectly as a pesticide. And false. This student, he tried it, and some poultry farmers and rabbit farmers have placed an order, and neem is what they are using. Neem is also used as mosquito repellent. So once Doug spoke about the malaria, then I wrote, okay, that could be the connection. So just neem oil, and these people are doing so much. And that was his, I think he might have learned it somewhere and using it. Um, once he was in school, he built on it, did all the tests to know what to do in the right amount. And he has created something for himself. And one of them, Saitek, they were with Agri House on a trip to Israel just last year with the National Best Farmer. And these are young guys. So when I sit down and I hear the youth are not interested in agriculture, that is never true. Mm. I have about 200 proposals on my desk 
with innovative ideas of youth wanting to do things. Yes. And we also came out with an agri-woman marketplace that is just for processing to do something. That what, um, baobab, baobab powder. And it was tested in the lab and some of the qualities are good for babies. Everyone has thrown it away. So I think for higher level of education, and this is just for Ghana, so you can just imagine Malawi, Kenya, every country definitely have something. What if we made use of these theses that our students have written and it's just there? And even for data, it's one thing having data and using these data to take decisions. Currently, we are, do, we are in Takrade um, doing a um, Women in Food and Agri Leadership Forum and the Gold in the Soil Award, where we are rewarding women excelling in agriculture. And last year, we had one, the best person for uh, Feed for Food. That was an award category for those into animal agriculture. And it was a female student from UCC, level 300. Mm -hmm. And she comes from Chuchuruga. And she, she won that award. This is a student and she's doing so much. So when now, if you, I sit there, if you ask me for 200 ladies into agriculture, I'm able to provide that organic data for you. Mm. And that would, maybe I wouldn't know what to do much with that data, but when we collaborate, private sector, public sector, we are able to do something with that data. Mm. So for higher level of education, it's not just about the data. What do we do with that data? What support are we giving to the public and the private agencies? Now we've stopped saying AgriHouse is an NGO. We say we are a project-oriented organization because apparently, possibly those who came earlier yeah. were just taking grants and misusing them. Yeah. But this is where you see the effect, the impact I have one young guy from English Amount for Senior High School. He's yet to make it into a tertiary, any tertiary institution. Mm -hmm. He has five acre of pineapple farm, and through mentorship, now he's able to supply to Blue Skies. And Blue Skies are products you you find on 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 in, in Tesco and any other market yeah. because it's of a certain quality. Yeah. If this young guy just here on the outskirts of Accra is able to do that. And I have students from University of Ghana mm -hmm. tell me I want a place to do my internship and I refer them there. What are we doing? There's so much we can do. We are joking about breaking Ghana. You know, permit me to just take um, you on this short um, way. Just take um, a short economic break. Stretch yourself. We'll be back to just take a last remarks and then we can crown this program. Okay, so let's take a quick break. solution center, solution aspect, where each of the panelists are just talking about the solutions to the problems from their discipline, from their background, where they come from. And then now I'm on Dr. Irene. Um, she is an academic at the uh, Westminster University in UK. And Doc, so from your point of view, you are from the academic point of view, and we're looking at the role of higher education in strengthening the resilience of agro systems that um, Michael has dealt with with what needs to be done in agro in the agro system industry, and we've had some from the crop improvement point of view. What is your from your point of view in the academic discipline? What role can you play in ensuring that human, economic, and social capital are all marshaled together and giving the necessary enhancements to contribute to economic development? Okay, so I think. Michael, you were very detailed in all the things you were doing. And I just wanted to ask you very briefly, um, if we asked you which institutions were very closely aligned to agribusiness, which institutions would you mention, higher education? Um, is it for these very projects I mentioned, I spoke about? Yes, yeah, so, so in general, if you were to choose two institutions that were working closely with you, what would they be, please? Uh, University of Ghana mm -hmm. and the Farm Institute, Ajidome, um, Ejra, Damango, Ohau, yes. Okay, and Mike, you know, did they approach you or did you approach them? I'm just Absolutely, coming to a yes. point. Yes. Uh, we, we, we approached them. Aha, uh -huh. 
it's interesting because the last time I was having a discussion with colleagues, mm -hmm. they were saying to me that, well, the institutions that we come from, mm -hmm. we do some work with our alumni, we do some work with some industries, but they weren't really courting industry. So we made up our minds, especially because although we're in the UK, our budgets are very limited. Mm -hmm. We decided to go and make partnerships with industry players. Yeah. So there are a number of companies that support our work. And the students, right through the courses, have to work with industry. So we have industry players who come in to speak, industry players who set up competitions, industry players that the students must pitch to, industry players who are a, 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 a part of the fabric. And whenever we revalidate our courses, we actually invite industry in. Yeah. And we say to them, what are the most important things our students need to learn? Mm -hmm. So we are teaching them management, we are teaching them entrepreneurship, what do they need? Yeah. And industry have been saying to us, for example, that soft skills are a problem. Soft skills. That our children are spending all their time on the telephones. So when they sit in front of somebody and have to articulate something, a solution, some of them struggle a little. Mm. Some of them don't really want to converse and so on and so forth. So these are the things that we think are real important. That as higher education institutions, we can't do it on our own in our departments. We must work as institutions, but we must also work with the partners who are willing. Okay. And some people say to me, but we don't have partners, but we have alumni. Mm. Alumni are there. Very many of them are so interested in coming back, giving talks, being a part of what we do. So I think these are some of the opportunities. I also wanted to mention the fact that lots of us do things on a small scale. Mm -hmm. And scaling up is one of our issues. So if, and again, I know government isn't going to do everything, but there might be opportunities maybe to set a little bit of money aside to help our students who've started something to scale up a little, to get a bit bigger. Because until we can employ people, we may be doing things on a small scale for a very, very long time. So I think we need to think about that. And also, Dr. Awa mentioned the fact that we need to support what comes from Ghana. And we need to support what comes from Africa. I went to do some work shadowing of one of my relatives. She works as a director in a bank, and I said to her, I, I won't mention her name, but I said, how come everybody is dressed in foreign clothing? And she said to me, oh, it's because we have Friday dress down. And I said, isn't there a bit of a disconnect there? Shouldn't we have Friday European dress? Why are we dressing in all these things that actually may not even suit our weather? And we have our AC on. These are little things that I think we can adjust. I mean, our African clothing is just marvelous. The people who are designing and tailoring are doing beautiful things. Why are we not patronizing things from our own country? Sure. And I just brought this up because just outside is a company. And this is what I'm talking about as well. So I got five items from them that I'm going to take away as presents. Great. I'm not sure how many of us have bought from that company. But actually, if we support what is going on, we will begin to make some progress. So I'm a bit of a dreamer, Great. but I think every distance that we go, at least one step is important. So these are some of the things we can do to move things forward. Absolutely. Giving back to our own. And finally, Dr. John, so we're taking it on the solution base. And from your point of view, with all the achievements you've made, the people you've trained who are continental, yeah. we're expecting a change. How long should we wait? <laughs> um, so, the time to act is now. So, th there's a complex of uh, many, many issues that I want to touch on. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the education space, the higher education space, we have standard curricula that we follow and this curricula is reviewed mm -hmm. and must still match international standards every five years. Okay. And the GTEC is responsible for re-accreditation of those programs. And so whatever innovations we want to put into our curriculum can be placed rightly into the curriculum. Mm. And so what we need to do is rather see how do we support universities? How do we invest into the universities? Because the universities are also struggling 
to get funding to be able to do all the innovative things that we, we want done. Mm -hmm. Okay, and when we look at the models that have worked internationally and globally, governments are central. Okay, governments are central. We cannot say that, oh, this can be done by the university, this can be done by this private institution. The private sector is a profit-making sector. Sure. And most of them are interested in quick profits. Now, the university and education is long-term investments. And even research, the research that we do, for instance, the varieties that we've developed, maize variety that is yielding 10 times what farmers are getting in their farms. That maize hybrid, it took 30 years of research to be able to find the right combination of parents that will give that yield of 10 tons per hectare. Nationally, farmers, maize farmers are getting one ton per hectare. And so for 30 year investment, which private sector is going to do that? And so let's be careful where we push certain things to. We cannot push uh, some of this load to private sector entities. And so government must be up and doing in the area of investing in our educational setup and ensuring that the curricula that is taught is transformed, is innovative, and is creating the right human capital that we need. Because Brazil, when they wanted to transform, had to train about 1,000 PhDs Focusing on what? Crop improvement and science and innovation. That now they have tomato varieties that are giving 80 tons, 60 tons per hectare. Interesting. At Waki, we have also developed varieties of tomato that we've released, three of them, which is yielding 40 tons per hectare. Our farmers are getting averagely 8 tons of tomato per hectare. So innovation and investments in innovation is central to development. Because all the industries you want to build, they need raw materials. And it has to come from agriculture. And so government has the responsibility to invest heavily in agriculture. And I go back to the Malabo Declaration that was in 2014, where the African Union heads of state mm -hmm. met and signed that agreement and declared that they were going to invest 10% of public expenditure in research for agricultural development. Mm -hmm. Where is that? Has it been done? Are we following up? We need to push and push and call governments to make sure they invest heavily in centers of excellence, because at Waki, all the things you are talking about, innovative curricula, we develop the curricula with industry. Industry players are on board. Right from the beginning, the curriculum caters for what? The industrial needs. We have two programs. One is PhD, plant breeding. The other one is Enfield, seed science and technology. For the seed science and technology program, it is split into 50% is science. You learn seed biology, seed science. 50% is business. You learn seed business, seed policy, trade, and all of that, and entrepreneurship. So our curricula is what? Innovative. It responds to the needs of industry. And so when our graduates go out, they fit perfectly into industry. They create businesses. And I must say that Dr. Maswell Asante is one of our alumni. Mm -hmm. He was uh, Ghana's best scientist two years running because of the investments that were made. And it's very expensive to train those plant breeders. $130,000 to train one of them. Mm. And because Waki was established with funds from Agra and supported 
by the World Bank and now the DAD, the German government, Waki is continuously developing this human capital for Africa. Yeah. And that is a model that should be what, scaled out across the need gaps, the gaps, to be able to cater for all the other industrial uh, sector needs. But when it comes to commercialization of our varieties, that is where we, there is a little bit of gap because our varieties have re been released, mm -hmm. uh, I think, five years now. Mm -hmm. But it's very difficult to get them to the farmers. Mm -hmm. We have reached the markets now, but even the volumes are not enough to cater for the needs. Okay. Because we need investments into seed production. We need more investments rather than importing seeds from outside. And so we are making this call on government to come in and really invest in seed production, improve seed production for our farmers, and also invest in what seed businesses that should cater for at least the seed needs of the country to stop the imports of most of the staples that we have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Put your hands together for the nice people. Um, that is where time permits us. And because of time, we would like to have some, um, some uh, views from you, questions. If you want to ask a question uh, for a quick clarification, you can uh, make that and then we can bring it to an end.